Special Adjustment Bureau. Hi, Pat. You've been neglecting me. <laughs> yeah, but think of all the trouble it saved me. Huh? Now, what's that supposed to mean? Well, I haven't had to bleed over one of those fancy expense accounts of yours for nearly a month. Oh, Pat, you cut me to the quick. Oh, sure, sure. But no, well, it looks as though I'll have to stick my neck out again. So, well, what's the problem? Well, Johnny, it's a real funny one. So I'm laughing already? Uh, no, no, no. I don't mean funny, ha-ha. I mean funny, peculiar. Hey, you know, the last time you said that, I got shot at, banged on the head, nearly run over by a truck, and half a dozen other pleasant little things. So come clean, Pat. What is it? Johnny, maybe you better run over here so we can talk about it. It'll cost you money. I'll risk it. Okay, then. I'm on my way. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the wayward sculptor matter. Why kid about it? Pat McCracken has handed me some pretty wild cases from time to time, but they've always paid off. So expense account item one at dollar twenty for a cab to his office at Universal Adjustment Bureau. Sit down, Johnny. Make yourself comfortable. Yeah. Hiya, Pat. Yeah. Cigarette? Oh, thanks. Here you are. Oh. Mm. Thanks. Well. Well, Johnny, you know that one of our big problems is discouraging and prosecuting insurance fraud. Not only against us, but against the companies we serve. Well, well I should hope so. Now, what I've called you about is something that's been going on for a long, long time. Okay. What kind of fraud is it this time? We never know. Huh? Look here. Yeah? A while back, International Life and Casualty received an envelope containing $520 in cash. Mm -hmm. And with it, this note that reads, Please put this in company treasury. This money I took from your company on false pretenses. Now I can have a clear conscience. And it was signed... Debtor. That's spelled B E T T E R. Hmm. Funny. Yeah, that's what I said to you over the phone. Here's another one. Eight hundred dollars in clothes. The sender identifying himself only as a sorry sinner. More conscience money, huh? Yeah, that's right. People who collected on fraudulent claims or felt they didn't deserve the money they collected. I see. And Johnny, there have been dozens of them over the years. Most of them have been small amounts, under a thousand dollars. Some of them only five or ten bucks. In other words, not worth investigating to see what fraud they perpetrated and why. Yes, exactly. But now look here. This uh, list of payments anonymously received, all of them from the same person. Eight hundred thirty-three dollars thirty-four cents received on July twenty-first, nineteen fifty-six. Right. Eight thirty-three thirty-four on August twenty-first, nineteen fifty-six. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same thing, September 21st. Same thing, the 21st of every month. Yes. And no letter with him? Only with the first one. Yes. You read it to yourself. Police and Trust and Insurance Company, gentlemen, this is only a beginning against the amount paid out on me last month. Be assured I shall make full restitution if it takes five years. Oh, good for him. Or her. I hope it keeps coming. No, Johnny, I want to know who's sending it. Well, now, yes, yes, what? yes, yes. Not only the law, but company policy. Demands that we prosecute anyone perpetrating a fraud. If you can. All the other conscience money has been in single payments. No way to trace them whatsoever. Also, the amounts have been, well, negligible. They have all these come from the same post office? Uh, they've all come from New York City, but from as many different post offices as the number of payments that have been made. But now, Pat, if the man is paying up all he took... Oh, well, how do we know, Johnny? How do we know he'll come through his promise? Well, and we don't know who he is, so we can't know how much he owes us or for what. So all you want me to do is comb through seven million people down in New York and somehow find the one man. Oh, yeah. now, I admit it's a challenge, Johnny. It sure is. But knowing you... You're right. There's only one thing to do. That's it. Give up. Oh, 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 now, listen. No, no, no. Wait. Give me a pencil and a piece of paper. Oh, uh, here you go. All right. 
He said even if it took him five years. Yeah. That's 60 months. And at 8.33, 34 a month. What? What are you doing? 60 years. 63, 34, 50, $50,000 and 40 cents. If so? All right. He started in July of 56 on money paid out the month before, he said. Yeah. So, find me a policy where Eastern Trust and Insurance paid off 50000 in June of 1956. Oh. And on what type of policy, might I ask? Life insurance? Oh, really, Mr. Detective? Why? Well, you change those monthly payments to $833.33 and a third cent. But who would cut a penny in the third? Uh, Johnny, you're right. You're right. In five years, it comes out to exactly 50000 And even figure like that is usually for life insurance. Yes, usually. Yes. You'll find the policy issued by Eastern, paid off in June of 50 Yeah, yeah it's a chance, Johnny, but let's try it. And then suddenly it all began to look too easy. In June 1956, the total number of $50,000 benefits paid came out to just exactly one on the life of Henry Davidson Pollock, a once famous sculptor. Beneficiary, his wife, Sarah Norton Pollock. And it gave her address in New York City. So Pollock didn't really die at all, but she collected his insurance. Now, conscience stricken, she is paying it back. That's what it looks like, but it's still fraud, so go to it, Johnny. Right. Expense account item two, eight dollars and a quarter, trained in New York in a cab to the apartment house at 614 East 49th Street. Failing to find Mrs. Pollock's name on the mailboxes, I got hold of the building superintendent. Mrs. Pollock? Sure. Mrs. Pollock lived here for years. Well, uh, where is she now, do you know? You trying to be funny? What do you mean? I mean she died last fall. Oh, great, great. Then it's too late. No, oh, no, wait a minute. Those payments are still coming in. What's that? You're sure that she's dead? I was with her when she died. Then, mister, what's going on around here happens to be just plain impossible. talking about the same person, the same Mrs. Pollock. Mrs. Henry Davidson Pollock. That's it. The widow of the sculptor. That's the one, all right. And he lived here in his apartment, too. That is, before he died. That was back in 56. Left all his money, all his insurance to his wife. Though so goodness knows why. How did he die? In that big plane crash out over the desert. Don't you remember? Not a single survivor. Uh, what, uh, what kind of a man was he? Oh, kept himself. Didn't like people much. And his wife? Okay, I guess. She was a lot younger than him. Spent all his money all the time. He didn't like it. Man like that shouldn't be married. Oh, but he must have thought a lot of it to leave her everything. He just didn't like being married, tied down. Let it interfere with his work. So his death got him out of it and give her some money to spend before she died. But somebody's been paying that money back. Well, now, uh, you think maybe she suffered a change of heart? Something like that? You think she realized she never deserved what he left her? Is that what you're thinking? Well, sure, that might have been a possibility. Except for one thing. The money's still coming in. Oh? Hey, is there anybody to whom she might have turned over that insurance? <laughs> her give anything to anybody else? <laughs> Not her, mister. And you're absolutely sure that she's dead? I carried her in off the street after the car hit her. If you don't believe me, ask a doctor. Dr. Jules Maitland over on Park Avenue. Ask the police. Yeah. Maybe I will. Item three fifty cents for a phone call to Pat McCracken back in Hartford. Yeah, but Johnny, if it was his wife who got that money and she wasn't the kind to pass it off to someone else, she'd have to be the one paying it back. But if she's dead... Died last fall, Pat. Well, the whole thing is impossible. Payments have still been coming in. There'll probably be another one plunked down on my desk by the time you get back here. Now, I tell you, somehow that woman must still be alive. So find her. Oh, Pat. Find her, Johnny. But why? Suppose by some miracle she is still alive. Where's the fraud? Look, people don't just hand over $50,000 for nothing. Somebody's conscience is hurting. What other possible reason could there be for sending that money back to us this way? Well, now, wait. Wait just a minute. All right, all right. Look, Johnny, I'll be honest with you. Maybe there isn't any fraud, so far as the company's concerned. All right. But, 
you know something, Johnny? This whole crazy thing has me so curious now that, well, even if there isn't any insurance angle to it... Except for the money the company keeps getting yeah, back. so, okay. But, Johnny, I want to know what this is all about. And if necessary, I'll pay your expense account myself. Well, now, Pat, this is the golden opportunity I've been uh, waiting for for years. Uh, 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 don't go overboard, Johnny, huh? But fine now for me, will you? Who knows? If I can. <laughs> Item 4785, taxi fare. They talked to Dr. Mason. No, there was no question about it. The woman who had died when the car struck her last fall was Mrs. Henry Davidson Pollock, wife of the sculptor. The doctor had known both of them very well. I checked with my old pal, Lieutenant Randy Singer, at 18th Precinct Police Headquarters. He, too, was sure the woman had died. He'd been called in on the case. Then I remembered something the superintendent of the apartment house had said to me about the way Pollock had wanted to get away from his wife. I went over to the New York Times and checked the old newspaper files. Yes, Henry Davidson Pollock had definitely been a passenger on the ill-fated aircraft and perished along with the rest. I even checked the main office of the airline and learned the same thing. So neither Pollock nor his wife could possibly be sending back that money. But then who could? And why? Dr. Nathan had mentioned a little art gallery over on 3rd Avenue, the only gallery that Pollock had ever dealt with directly. The owner of the gallery was a nervous little man by the name of Walter Besson. No, no, Mr. Dollar. Strange as it may sound, I never met Mr. Pollock. But I thought you were the only outlet for his sculpture. Very true, very true. But he was a man who stayed very much by himself, abhorred the public eye, so to speak. Yes. yes. Well, now, nevertheless, you must have. You see, it was his wife who always brought his works in here for me to sell. and was always very sure to collect the money for them. Quite frankly, I doubt if Pollock himself ever saw much of the money that resulted from his artistry. Were his sculptures worth very much, Mr. Besson? Mr. Dollar, I have yet to find anyone who has seen his work without wanting to possess some of it. It's beautiful, exciting. Oh? In addition to his superb technique, his originality of design, there was a subtle charm about everything he did that was, well, irresistible. Look here, the only one I have left. Fawn at play. Isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, I, I see what you mean. Yeah. It's such a little thing, but uh, what's the price of it? Fifteen thousand dollars. But now wait. Here, this one over here. It is not a Mr. Dollar. Is it? What? Well, look, I'm not an expert on these things, but it. It seems to me as though it has the same, well... Yes, the same style, the same charm, the same delicacy of line. It, too, is a fine work of art. And if I chose, I could pass it off as a genuine Pollock. But it isn't. Then who did it? And this, this one over here. John Wesley Collins. He so admired Pollock's work that he felt the style, at least, should not be allowed to die. Therefore, he has subjugated whatever style he himself might have had to that of the man he worshipped. Fortunately for him, his work, too, command a good price so that... Oh, please, don't touch... Oh, sorry. How long has this man Collins been doing this? Well, something over two years. Thanks, Mr. Besson. I think you've just helped me solve a $50,000 insurance fraud. Well, Mr. Besson, I'll see you later. I walked out the front door of the little light gallery on 3rd Avenue. Over my shoulder as I closed the door, I could see the owner, Walter Besson, make a dance to the little office inside and grab a telephone. I sneaked back in, stepped over behind a rack of picture frames and canvases and whistled. Henry, this is Walter, Walter Besson. Listen. No, listen. Something has just happened that... Well, there was a man here, Johnny Dollar, some kind of insurance investigator, so you... No, no, you mustn't. But if he comes back here... <clears throat> Very well, I'll unlock the back door for you. But are you sure you... Hello, Henry? Henry? While Besson went to the back door, I quietly slipped out the front. 
I found a telephone booth at the drugstore on the corner. Item five, a dime for a phone call to Dr. Jules Maitland. Uh, yes, Mr. Dowler. As I told you when you were here, uh, they were both patients of mine for several years. All right, Doctor, tell me this. Did Henry Davidson Pollock have a scar, a deep scar on the thumb, one hand, the right hand? Uh, yes, yes. He told me that when he was a child, he cut through the tip of that thumb very deeply, all the way down to the bone. That's all I wanted to know. Well, now, tell me, Thank sir. you, Doctor. Thanks a lot. trip to the corner on that phone call couldn't have taken me more than five or six minutes. And when I went back to the art gallery, Besson was coming out of the little office, careful to close the door of it behind him. Well, Mr. Dollar, I didn't expect you to return, at least not so soon. Have you decided to buy one of the sculptures by John Wesley Collins, perhaps? No. Of course, insofar as the one remaining genuine Pollock is concerned. What's the matter, sir? Besson... Would you like to sit down and write a statement for me? Statement? I'm afraid I don't understand. Or would you rather I call in the police? What are, what are you talking about? I told you before, Mr. Besson, fraud. What? And since it's pretty obvious that you're an accessory... Fraud, an accessory? You mentioned the great similarity between the sculptures of Henry Davidson Pollock and John Wesley Collins. Yes, and I told you the reason for it. Did you? Of course. All right, look here. This one. Fawn, a play, you called it. It's a Pollock, the genuine Pollock. You'd swear to that? Of course I would. And how could you prove it? Well, well, there's one way. The marks left by the artist's right thumb. Here. And here, for instance. Because that thumb was split on the end, left its imprint on the clay. Oh, no, no, Mr. Dollar. And I can prove that these recent things done by the man you call John Wesley Collins were done by the same person. They all bear that same mark. Very well, Mr. Dollar. But the world will never know. Oh, now, Bessem, put that thing down. Yes, put it down, Walter. Henry, I, I mean, Mr. Collins, I... Henry will do. Mr. Dollar, I suppose I should have known that sooner or later... Well, you know, I give myself up to you. But, Henry, if the story is a simple one, Mr. Dollar. I suppose you'd like to hear it. Yeah, I certainly would. Now, you see... I wanted to get away from my wife for reasons that we don't really have to go into. I planned to fly out to the West Coast to disappear. But at the, you know, at the last minute, I, I gave the plane a ticket to someone else. On the plane that crashed out there over the desert? Yes, yes. Then, knowing that my wife thought me dead, and realizing I could become lost in this tremendous city as well as anywhere else in the world, I... But I'd forgotten about the insurance. So then, anonymously, of course, I started throwing it back. I see. All of this was very wrong, I know. Well, I'm afraid it's something for the courts now, Mr. Pollard. Mr. Dollar, the works of John Wesley Collins have sold very well at good prices. Only this morning, listen, I was able to mail a whole balance of the $50,000 to the insurance company. Do you think that will help, sir? So, Pat, there you have it. And you can take whatever action you may think is necessary. Pollock is waiting for the company or the courts or whoever. And Walter Besson is too scared to go anywhere. As for the press account, I think the company can afford it. The total, including the trip back to Hartford, is $26.15. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, one of my oldest and wildest friends in one of my rarest and wildest adventures. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. And is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Herb Bygren, Edgar Barrier, Carlton G. Young, Will Light, and Lawrence Dobkin. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
This is Dan Coverly speaking. <laughs>